I'm glad to introduce you to the second panel entitled Inversions When Narrative Becomes Institutions, which continue to interrogate the canon narrative, some of the structure architectures discussed in the previous panel, seeking on their possible transformation, the challenges that this implies, and sometimes their impossibilities. How does one do things with canon narratives? How does one deconstruct and reconstruct them in the order to accommodate other realities and historical experiences, such as, as histories of oppression, indigenous ontologies and practices, and critics of nation? This panel invites us to the flip sides of the canonic and the unconscious of modernity. Yesterday, we explored the Museum in Exile for the Palestinian people by the 1978 International Art Exhibition for Palestine. We continue today with a talk by Lara Kaldi entitled The Renegade Object and the Hollow Museum on the Current State of the Museums in Palestine. Here, Lara Kaldi continues to examine and reflect on the contemporary situation of museum in Palestine. Although over the past few years, there has been an accelerated desire and an actual proliferation of buildings of several museums and archive projects in Palestine, those projects have triggered an array of debates and questions, and their opening have been constantly failing. Her talk will begin with a short story of a possible counter museum, and it will follow by an overview of the current Palestinian museums under construction. Lara Kaldi is an independent curator based in Jerusalem. She's currently teaching at the International Academy of Art in Ramallah. Among others, Kaldi curated the exhibition Father, Can't You See I'm Burning at the Apple Art Center in Amsterdam in 2014. And she's opening in April very soon an art space in Ramallah called The Copy Room. Please help me to welcome Lara. Thank you, Paz, for this lovely introduction. Um, and um, thank you uh, and Anselm for uh, the invitation. It's really great to be here. Um, let me find. In 2012, I was co-curating the Jerusalem Show, which is an annual exhibition at Al Ma'mal Art Foundation and different venues in the old city of Jerusalem. Eric Beltran, one of the invited artists, started a research project about the first intifada, or first uprising of 1987. He was interested in that generation's resistance to speak and in the manashir, or communiques issued by the unified national leadership of the uprising in the late 80s. Which, um, these are communiques which mobilized the Palestinians uh, while under occupation, under military occupation, and it was circulated in order to inform populations of the date time for demonstrations, for example, or strikes or uh, acts of civil disobedience, um, as well as communicate political statements about recent events. Eric uh, asked me whom he could interview. I assumed I would start with my closest surroundings. I told him stories I had heard, that along with other comrades, my parents might actually have been involved in printing the communiques in one city and smuggling them into another, in strollers placed underneath their, their daughters and sons. The communiques would be disseminated, read, and instantly destroyed. Sometimes the sudden change of circumstances, like a military campaign or the arrest of a prominent party member, would deem it dangerous to distribute them, and the group in charge of the dissemination would be struck, stuck with piles of them that they would, were forced to destroy at once without any evidence which would attract attention, like a fire, for example. One of the urban myths around the first intifada is that stacks of those communiques are buried deep in people's backyards or were dumped in liquid concrete about to be plastered, becoming the very concrete structures of the city. 
It is said that in various former activists' backyards and in various walls, they are buried, dormant, are the material archives of the First Intifada. Eric wanted to interview people that might have been involved, so I took him to see a friend of my father's. At the meeting, my father and his friend questioned Eric about where he's from in Mexico, quizzed him about political affiliations, asked of his opinions about massacres of Native Americans, about what he thought of Israeli occupation. Eric um, um, finally asked about their involvement in the First Intifada. In answer, they claimed that they were not involved actively at all. Even as witnesses, they did not have much to say, more than what is already common knowledge. Much later, they explained to me why they were both so guarded. It was very simple. While my generation sees the first intifada as part of the history of the Palestinian struggle, one to speak, write, research, and make projects about, the generation of my father, of the first intifada, see it as ongoing. They cannot speak about it because they understand that they might jeopardize and compromise former comrades, and that they were still, there were still unresolved cases that people could go to Israeli prisons for. More so, there were Palestinian political detainees um, and prisoners who are still in Israeli prisons since the First Intifada. Although they know and are certain the First Intifada is over, has been over since the signing of the Oslo Accords in 1993, was even followed by what they call a pastiche intifada, they refuse to speak of the experience. They understand that once they speak of it, once it's aesthetized in a sense, once it's exhibited, museumized, then that would mean its true death when it is no longer deemed dangerous knowledge, when it is no longer threatening authority and power, only then will they be able to talk about it. They are also aware that the power lies in its burial and that it needs to remain dormant, that it is buried deep in the land itself in order for it to resurrect one day. It is a fugitive archive. There are archives which are forgotten which the archive ignores or refuses to include. But here it is the archive which refuses to be included, not only because it refuses to be complicit with what the archive signifies, but also because it is aware that it needs to protect itself from an imminent threat. These objects and archives that could work as evidence to prove and criminalize their user must remain unearthed, but they are but they also remain as the potential that lurks beneath the ground. The renegade object is that which resists entering the museum, as it is aware that once it enters the museum, it will be deemed obsolete. Over the past few years, there has been a proliferation of museum building in Palestine. While a few have managed to open, most of the museums have been failing to. This project, or paper, is an attempt at reading both this proliferation and its inherent failure, whether actual, um, in the sense that some of those museums have been expected to open for the past three years um, and have been postponing, or symbolic, in the sense that a Palestinian museum is somewhat impossible. These projects pose questions about the institution of the museum as such and has the potential to reveal and change it. Conversely, the institution of the museum provokes question, questions about the current local context. These museums are symptomatic of many failures, be it of the failure of the institution of the museum, revealing its complicity with the nation state and its historical relationship with colonialism, or a symptomatic death and perhaps failure of a politics of emancipation. Palestinian museums are empty museums, devoid of collections, because the material culture is either confiscated, destroyed, or lies in colonial museums or secret military archives. Under current circumstances, an unrecognized state, a lack of sovereignty in the legal sense, those museums cannot be loyal to the promise of every other museum to preserve and protect um, the objects which enter it. 
And so to collect and exhibit whatever remaining original objects would be an implicit gesture of denying the present political circumstances. We are all aware, of course, of the long history of criticism of the institution of the museum and its semblance uh, to the mausoleum and relationship to death. Hence, the impossibility of these museums, represented by their emptiness, presents a great opportunity at thinking through a museum without collections or original objects, but is also symptomatic of an inherent resistance to announcing, exhibiting um, this history uh, of a certain politics. Many other questions and conditions make Palestinian museums impossible. For example, as my friend Haitham Wardani um, noted, a Palestinian museum is primarily a museum of, of the oppressed, which is paradoxical because the form with which the institution of the museum represents history, whether of art or any other genre, its structure compels a coherent linear narrative, which is a form that in fact oppresses the voices of the oppressed. In addition, the institution of the museum has an umbilical cord connected to the institution of the state, so that we can read one through the other. In the case of the Palestinians, with the absence of the state, does the museum function as that imagined autonomous space? Does it represent the desire for a state? Is it symptomatic of a rigid nationalist agenda? Or could it be a more open museum which needs to speak with other oppressed people? How is this relationship negotiated? And how does a stateless museum function differently from a museum inside a national state? Indeed, what would a museum of the oppressed look like? These are not questions which I answer. Those are rather questions which this recent proliferation of the institution of the museum generates. Um, actually, those, just to note, I mean, um, these questions are very similar to, to ones um, which were instigated by the, the very well-known project by Khaled, by artist Khaled Harani, uh, called Picasso in Palestine, where a room at the International Art Academy Palestine was converted into a humidity and security controlled room to house a painting by Picasso, which was loaned and arduously shipped from the Van Abe Museum in, in Holland to Ramallah in 2011. Um, so in order for you to understand, I mean, this current kind of advent of museum building, perhaps um, I thought I could describe some of those museums to you. Um, this one is within the presidential compound in Ramallah. Um, and this is the, the Yasser Arafat Museum, and it's a kind of memorial um, museum. It's a project of the Palestinian Authority um, under the Yasser Arafat Foundation, um, which was founded in 2006. It, the, the museum has not opened yet. Um, it, it's under construction. The uh, honorary chairman of the board is the Palestinian president, Mahmoud Abbas, while the actual chairman is um, Arafat's nephew and former foreign minister, Dr. Uh, uh, Nasser al Qudwe. Um, the museum um, was designed by um, Palestinian Jordanian architect Jafar Tukan, who also um, designed the Mahmoud Darwish Museum, which opened um, two years ago um, in 2000. Uh, um, uh, no, in 2012, um, and it hosts a, a very small permanent collection of the um, uh, renowned uh, uh, poet, uh, Mahmoud Darwish. Um, but to go back to the Yasser Arafat Museum, um, this, is, uh, um, this is inside the museum, so it's basically... Um, um, it's going to host a permanent exhibition of um, Palestinian history from the last 100 years with uh, naturally uh, an emphasis on the history of, of the PLO throughout. The corridor is going upwards. Um, there are about four ramps until um, it's you know, leading to the former headquarters of the um, late president. Um, and uh, you could see the, the rooms and the meeting, you know, the, the private bedroom and the meeting room of the late president while he was under siege 
um, in 2000, from 2002 till 2004 um, in, in the presidential compound. Um, I mean, objects that will be exhibited are uh, some of the gifts given to, to uh, Yasser Arafat uh, from people and different uh, uh, presidents. Um, but what, what I mean, what I know about it, uh, what I know from uh, different people is that there is a debate, ongoing debate about um, how to show this uh, this history, which which periods to emphasize, for example, um, uh, besides the the Nakba, uh, the different intifadas, um, uh, but it is a very kind of uh, national. It, it's a it's a very kind of selective. Um, um, kind of um, PLO-centric uh, historical timeline. <laughs> um, actually, while I was so outside this museum, uh, there is the, of course, the grave of the late President Yasser Arafat, um, and so it is a, a mausoleum in, in that sense. Um, and actually, while I was visiting um, this image of, of uh, the two guards guarding the, the grave uh, reminded me very much of the Picasso in Palestine project, where it's exactly, you know, this um, same image. And I think, you know, uh, Khalid Hurani, I mean, funny enough, Khalid Hurani is also involved in uh, the, the Yasser Arafat uh, museum in, in, in different ways. He sits on the, on the board. Um, uh, but I think, I mean, he was very aware of all these kind of problematics while he was also working on his project, Picasso in Palestine. Um, so the other museum, I mean, this is just another view from uh, inside the museum to, to the outside. Um, the other museum, which is also under construction and set to open this year, is the Palestinian Museum in Birzeit. Um, the project was started in 1998 by the Welfare Association as a Nakba Memorial Museum at the beginning, but soon changed into a more open structure when the board hired Palestinian American academic Bshara Dumani, who is now professor of modern Middle Eastern history at Brown University, um, where he put this idea of the satellite museums so that the building at Birzit is only one part and where other satellite museums, um, uh, wherever there is Palestinian diaspora around the world, was, will host exhibitions. Uh, indeed, this is still the case. In May, while the building in Birzeit opens, another exhibition by the Palestinian Museum titled At the Seams, A Political History of Palestinian Embroidery, will open at, uh, in Beirut. Um, the Palestinian Museum has been publishing research uh, for the past two years, which I quote and use in this uh, paper, um, and also participating in cultural events in, in Palestine before its official inauguration. Uh, there's a very specific focus on research, um, which is historical, factual research, I think. So, for example, one of the projects of the museum is the Palestine Historical Timeline, which is being developed in collaboration with the uh, Institute for Palestine Studies um, and as you can guess from the title, it is a, a historical timeline of, of modern Palestinian history. Um, so very similar to the Yasser Arafat Museum. Uh, this, this historical timeline will, is, um, uh, is going to be online. Uh, um, it's, it was uh, being worked on as an online kind of uh, 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 part uh, of the museum. Uh, other projects are family album, um, um, and I mean, it is not clear whether the museum will be housing a collection yet, and of what exactly. Um, until very recently, the plan was to host an archive of documents and images, but the building indicates that it will be hosting a, co a, a collection of artifacts. Um, uh, the exhibition hall, which is actually the smallest part of the, of the museum. It's a very small uh, museum. The exhibition hall is 500 meters square, um, um, has no natural light. Um, I mean, is, is clearly designed for um, uh, preserving um, um, a permanent collection. I mean, 
most of the museum is dedicated to storage areas. Um, and it's designed by a Dublin firm, uh, Hannigan Peng Architects. It's on top of the hill of a hill in Birzeit, right next to the main um, Palestinian university, Birzeit University, right next to the campus. And it's, I mean, it's 15 minutes away from Ramallah, north, north of Ramallah. Um, other um, museums, uh, so this is the, the garden, where the, the plants are kind of indigenous Palestinian plants. Uh, other museums which are under construction, you know, quickly, uh, is Al Ruwaya or Narrative M uh, Museum in Bethlehem, still hasn't opened, uh, City of Ramallah Museum, the Museum of Natural History in Beit Sahur, the Museum of Destroyed Villages, many others, um, also abroad. Uh, I mean, there's a really interesting um, a museum that has recently been announced. It's, I mean, interesting in parallel to, to the, the exhibition of uh, Russia and Christine here. Uh, it's the Modern and Contemporary Art Museum Palestine, which historian, uh, poet, and UNESCO Palestinian representative Elias Sanbar is working on. Uh, where works of art are being donated by international artists. Uh, already, I think they have tens of works in the collection and will remain in the custody of the Institute of uh, uh, Institut du Monde Arabe in Paris and probably tour until they can eventually return to Jerusalem, where the museum will eventually be. Um, actually, Lias Sambar gave a really interesting um, uh, paper at uh, when uh, this same exhibition was uh, exhibited in um, Makba. Uh, he gave a, a, a talk uh, titled Muse Musée de la Vide, um, uh, a museum full of emptiness, uh, um, explaining that a Palestinian museum should be a museum full of emptiness um, with different anecdotes. Um, other museums, on, there are online museums, like for example an online uh, Nakba museum, which is a private endeavor funded by a Qatari philanthropists. Um, this is a really um, strange museum that opened about a year ago. It's, a, it's the Russian Museum in Jericho. Um, and it's, it's, it's built on this land previously owned by a Russian, I mean, the Tsar, and then handed back over to Russia in 2008 by the Imperial Orthodox Palestine Society. Um, so you have these museums mushrooming, these different museums, yeah. Um, Palestinian museums are museums of the future really, I mean, not, not the past. One assumes that every museum contains objects that were made in a chronological kind of order uh, that has already passed. The Palestinian museum's objects belong to the future because they are not yet at the museum. Palestinian museums are really empty museums. In an unpublished manuscript titled Heritage and the Struggle for Palestine, author Kiara de Cesari traces the blueprints of Palestinian public museums in the end of the 90s and early 2000s and their failures. De Cesari writes, in spite of the richness of the archeology span of the region, one of the problems of the Palestinian Authority museums is the lack of artifacts. The majority of movable Palestinian cultural property is in Jerusalem or in Israel or in the collections of international colonial institutions such as British, like the British Museum. End of quote. Um, the lack of objects, artifacts, or art collections in Palestine is due to the dispersal of the Palestinians um, and their material belongings, uh, the confiscation of land uh, since the Nakba of 1948 and the British mandate before, before that. Most museums under construction, like the Palestinian Museum, and uh, another museum, which is the Al-Riwaya Museum in Bethlehem, which are due to open in Ramallah and Bethlehem in 2016, will not be exhibiting objects, or at least their present collections consist of video and audio material, uh, which are stories about objects and events. In fact, also the Yasser Arafat Museum uses a lot of audio and, and visual material. Um, 
In a booklet called Al-Matahaf, Al-Matahaf Al-Palestinia, or Palestinian Museums, published in 2014 by the Palestinian Museum, accompanying a pre-opening exhibition, 39 Palestinian museums are listed, of which three are outside historical Palestine. The museums representing individuals like Mahmoud Darwish, um, uh, like poet Mahmoud Darwish, do have a collection of personal objects. Um, However, when it comes to more collective museums, those are mostly either exhibiting scarce and dubious kind of archaeological objects, heritage objects, or folkloric objects, as most of the museums contain everyday garments and objects that Palestinian individuals gifted to the museums. Um, one of the really uh, my favorite examples is an object uh, exhibited at the, um, a museum called the Palestine, Palestinian Heritage Museum in Taira, in Lebanon, in Sur. And it's a sewing needle from pre-1948. The label explains that it is a Palestinian needle from before the Nakba, courtesy Um Khaled Khashan and her mother-in-law, the late Ghazale Mahmoud, 12th February 2006. The label refers to a needle which the two ladies carried with them from Palestine when they became refugees during the Nakba of 1948. And one is sure that what Um Khaled left in Palestine were many more objects and belongings than the, this very needle. One cannot help but ask what made Um Khaled give away the needle, as there is nothing about the needle that actually looks like it was manufactured and used pre-1948, right, in Palestine. But that is because Im Khaled and the museum curators are very aware that it is the museum which makes the needle look like it is pre-1948 and not the object itself. The museum's mission, this particular museum in Taira, is to collect objects from Palestinians pre-1948. Most of the museums listed, especially the two in refugee camps in Lebanon, are small heritage museums whose mission is to prove to the Israelis and the world that the Palestinians did inhabit Palestine before 1948. It is worth to note here that the Palestinian Museum also started out as a project for a museum for Palestine uh, pre-1948, uh, one that is very similar to those uh, small dispersed museums, uh, but on a bigger scale. And one of the problems that it had was that it could not locate, um, I mean, this is um, according to the museum, or, nor uh, collect objects that it could uh, exhibit. All the objects in the aforementioned museums are mundane and personal and kind of unscientific in the sense of a historically sound classification. But most importantly, most of these museums are personal initiatives by public figures in their locales or the community. Um, I mean, the second half of these museums, right, and these museums are uh, ones which are, you know, open, functioning, um, are the museums which the Ministry of Antiquity uh, in, the, in the Palestinian uh, Authority uh, opened, I mean, mostly in, um, in the early 2000s. And for example, uh, this one is... Uh, is the Hisham Palace Museum in Jericho. Um, and um, this is a site-specific um, museum. It's an important uh, early Islamic archaeological site that was excavated uh, by a Palestinian and, and British archaeologists in the uh, 1930s uh, until, I mean, the, the excavation started in 1930 and ended in 48. And... Um, uh, in 1948, most of the findings were seized uh, by the Israeli authorities and exhibited at the Rockefeller Museum in Jerusalem instead. I mean, the Rockefeller Museum in Jerusalem was actually um, called the uh, um, Palestinian Archaeology Museum um, before then. Um, there is also this, uh, uh, the Samaritan Museum it's a museum of the still living uh, Samaritan community's heritage and history in the West Bank. It's a small museum uh, for a, a Palestinian kind of ethno-religious uh, group closely related to Judaism that have remained in Palestine and are considered the, the smallest uh, ethno-religious group in the world. The booklet uh, mentions that several Old Testament Torah 
uh, from the collection of this museum were stolen. Um, uh, both museums contain few objects on display um, and of whatever remains after um, uh, looting and confiscation of, of objects. Um, however, what is most interesting about these two museums and what seems like a connecting thread in what the Palestinian Authority's Department of Tourism and Antiquity deems important to preserve, renovate and make public uh, are more site-specific museums. Ones where even though most of the objects um, are looted or have disappeared, the site itself, I mean, uh, uh, so in the cases of those museums, the ruins of the Hisham Palace and the living culture of the Samaritans are still visible. It's a, it's a kind of symptomatic of, of a political desire to show you know, sovereign power over, over land on behalf of the, of the Palestinian Authority, kind of exhibition of, of uh, sovereignty for a coming Palestinian um, state. Nonetheless, uh, mu these museums continue to shed their objects uh, there are many examples and stories of missing and lost Palestinian archives, um, paintings and objects that could theoretically also be housed by all these museums and the ones due to open shortly, um, uh, that until this day are still uh, disappeared. One of the most known is the Palestinian organization, uh, uh, PLO, uh, Palestinian Liberation Organization's film unit, the Palestine Film Archive, which included thousands, uh, which disappeared in 1982 um, um, during the Israeli invasion on Beirut. Um, the Palestinian Film Archive uh, included thousands of uh, film reels uh, documenting the Palestinians' everyday life uh, in the diaspora, as well as the armed struggle in Lebanon and abroad. The archive included collaborations on uh, feature uh, and documentaries, such as between the, the you know, the, the well-known films between the Japanese Red Army and the uh, left-wing Palestinian political parties. This archive disappeared in 1982 during the Israeli invasion, uh, and the loss of this archive has been actually a subject of many Palestinian films, some of which are Kings and Extras by Azza al Hassan, for cultural purposes by Sarah Wood, and most recently Off Frame by uh, Muhannad Yaqubi. The, whereabout, the whereabouts of this archive were never found out, and um, um, there are only stories and oral accounts of what might have happened to it. Um, uh, some say it has been burnt, uh, looted, uh, dispersed uh, among uh, many Palestinians in an attempt to salvage it, um, or a combination of all three. But the, you know, this, this actual loss right, or emptiness the archive has produced is what generated a kind of poetic production that is neither nostalgic nor attempts to reassemble the past, um, but is pointing to the whole in the archive. Uh, that is caused by the loss of the archive itself. And even more so, it is interesting to compare how the, the PLO in Lebanon started becoming and acting like a national institution by centralizing uh, archives, which could be read almost as a, a struggle to or attempt to enter the canon of history, speaking of canons, um, with the struggle inside the uh, occupied territories during the first intifada, where there seems to have been an awareness that the struggle is against the institution represented by the state, right, and embodied by an instant destruction of the means right, of resistance. So even though there is currently a strong desire to historicize and monumentalize Palestinian national history and identity in order to build upon these foundations a material testimony for a Palestinian nation state, the emptiness that is left by the disappeared, looted, and lost archives and objects resists this pull. Um, well, I mean, uh, film archives uh, and um, f whole exhibitions are you know, not the only example of lost artworks. It seems that losing objects and artworks became somewhat a Palestinian tradition, um, one that is um, not only practiced by the Israelis, but that takes place because the destination of return, usually Palestine, is continuously shifting. In an article titled 17 Lost Exhibitions, 
by uh, Jack Persekian, the former director of the Palestinian Museum, the one in Birzeit, uh, introduces a research project done by the, uh, like a, a survey kind of um, uh, research uh, done by the Palestinian Museum on lost collections of artworks in Palestinian uh, art exhibition history. Persekian writes, uh, indeed, it was the realization of a pattern. I'm, I'm almost done. Okay. Um, Persekian writes, indeed, it was the realization of a pattern of loss, not only of single works of art, but of an entire curated exhibitions of Palestinian art displayed all over the world that inspired the Palestinian Museum's latest research project, 17 Lost Exhibitions. The survey was carried out on dispersed exhibitions from the 1970s until 2014, where the information was pieced together from individual and sometimes opposed testimony, testimonies by those involved in the exhibitions, as documentation of the exhibitions was scared, scarce or had mostly vanished. Uh, the exhibitions chronicle different stories of loss, so sending paintings abroad to Europe or America for an exhibition where the paintings do not find their way back uh, out of negligence, or the artworks tour to different parts of Palestine where they're confiscated by uh, Israeli soldiers uh, in a particular city, or destroyed during clashes. Um, for example, a collection um, uh, uh, of the Ministry of, of Culture that disappeared during an Israeli uh, incursion in Ramallah in 2002. Others, for example, are sent for an exhibition in Tunisia to, to end up as part of the collection of the Tunisian prime minister, and so on. The, the information in the published research results focuses more on the circumstances of the loss of the, these artworks rather than the which artworks uh, or collections were lost. In Persekian's introduction, which I assume here now, um, I mean, um, Persekian is kind of expressing a certain narrative of the Palestinian Museum. There seems to be two discourses being communicated simultaneously. One is that the museum's sense of national responsibility and that this research um, uh, is conducted partly so that it instigates the process of a kind of repatriation uh, of those artworks. Why else would the Palestinian Museum initiate such research, Persekian writes? In this context, the publication of the newsletter, whose initial investigation into the matter goes deeper than any under undertaking so far, was something of a bold move, especially since the research cannot guarantee that it will lead to the successful recuperation of any of the paintings or even the discovery of their exact whereabouts. So it is not really the return of the artworks or even the artworks themselves that are being emphasized by the research again. Somehow, it seems that what Persekian is insinuating is that the museum is where loss is perhaps simply registered, but, and again, another, another quote. Um, one of, um, I will skip that, because I don't have a lot of time. So one of the underlying messages of the research project is also to disclose that Palestinian heritage and collection is neglected, is not cared for and preserved aptly, right? And at present, the responsible body for this would be the Palestinian Authority's Ministry of Culture. The Palestinian Museum promises that it will act in its place, right? That with its preserv preservative powers, it will protect this loss from taking place again. So I quote from uh, Persekian again, the second motivation for the research, however, is to produce a survey of past exhibitions that shows the mistakes that have been made and the problems that have been encountered in the hope that we and our fellow institutions across Palestine will be able to learn from them. With the political situation in Palestine remaining as it is, the future of Palestinian art and museums cannot be a certain or a safe one. But with projects like this, we are working to strengthen its foundations and set it on the best possible course. End of quote. So while the Palestinian Museum seems very aware of the very imminent repetitive possibility of loss and what the exposure of a centralized collection in a museum in Palestine to utter vulnerability means, right, it paradoxically still desires to operate as a protector of this material culture. 
Again, here one could sense this paradoxical dilemma. A desire to be a sovereign entity is in tension with the history and present of, of loss, where even the messages of um, an institution such as the forthcoming Palestinian Museum are themselves conflicting. On one hand, there is a desire to be a totalitarian kind of representative for Palestinian culture, also with the Yasser Arafat kind of um, historical timeline, and the protector of objects, artifacts, you know, and, and artworks. Yet on the other hand, it is d defined by its inability to do so. It has no collection, it publishes research on lost artworks, it prophesizes its own probable demise, and yet it still plans to open as a fully functioning museum. I'm ending. Okay. I, I will end with another story. So, um, in one of the interviews of a collection called Never Part, uh, a project which I attempted to work on, um, which was uh, founded by former director of the museum, uh, Jack Persekian, um, and it's, it's, a, it's an assemblage of uh, 200 80 recorded interviews with Palestinians in Palestine and the diaspora. Um, and each interview is on an object uh, in the possession of the interviewee that he or she is not uh, ready to part with, right? In one of these interviews, uh, a second generation Palestinian living in Sao Paulo talks about a Greco-Roman uh, amphora that his father gave him. He chronicles that this amphora was excavated from an archaeological site in Safuria, uh, or Sephoris, in Palestine, by his father, along with an American archaeological uh, excavation team, in the 1930s. The interviewee's father decided to keep this amphora because he knew um, uh, the excavated artifacts would end up at um, a British or an American museum. Thus, the amphora in this case needs to be protected from the colonial museum, and its disappearance alludes to kind of a lurking continued resistance of colonialism. Um, so, you know, the son keeps this amphora, and for him it becomes um, the embodiment of all these stories and his connection with uh, uh, Palestine, right? The Palestinian Museum presents it as an individual story with an object. And the plan is to exhibit it, at, exhibit the interview, right, at some point. But you know, when when we saw this interview, uh, we were unsure as whether to to exhibit it, because we imagined that in a few years, perhaps, when the Palestinian state, perhaps, is recognized, that the Palestinian State Museum will actually use this video to claim this very same amphora as stolen, no, property. <laughs> um, yeah, I mean, it's, it's, it's a kind of um, never-ending paradox with, uh, with these museums, I guess. And on this note, yeah, thank you. <laughs> the panel continues with the hybrid museological model of the Museo del Barrio in Asuncion, Paraguay, founded in the 70s, to shake the limits and the distance between indigenous contemporary art and the visual arts. Its director and co-founder, Ticio Escobar, will invite us to join him first in his philosophical critical reflections on the term of autonomy, which in the museological practice relegated indigenous art outside of the fine art museums, and will continue to present this hybrid model of the Museo del Barro, where indigenous art is exhibited with the same right of contemporaneity than the fine arts. The talk is entitled The Museum and the Other Side. Ticio Escobar is a lawyer, curator, professor, art critic. He has published more than a dozen of monographs on art and culture in Paraguay and Latin America, also through an hybrid writing between philosophy, ethnography, and contemporary art. Among others, he published The Course of Namur in 2007 and The Invention of Distance that you find as well in the Hakabe bookshop. From 2008 until 2013, Escobar was the Minister of Culture in Paraguay, and he's the author as well of the legislation on Paraguayan culture. Please help me to welcome Ticio Escobar. Well, good afternoon. I'm sorry for talking in Spanish. 
First of all, I would like to thank for this wonderful invitation by the House of World Cultures. And in particular, I would like to thank Anselm and Paz and their team. They've been so nice and welcoming. Now, in order to raise the question of the canon, we should consider different ways of constructing museums or establishing um, museology or museality. And in my talk, I will discuss a possible dis deconstruction of the hegemonic canon of the museum and present an alternative path towards museality. I would like in my presentation to focus on a number of fundamental aspects which have been raised during this conference already, like, for example, the limit and the very idea of the autonomy of art, which, if it is being threatened, means a fundamental movement if we overcome limits, if we abolish limits, we are dealing with the problem of safeguarding or maintaining the tension between what is inside and what is outside of the museum. So autonomy and the loss of the autonomy of art is an important aspect in the context of the field we are considering here and has numerous references in terms of its history, in terms of politics, in terms of psychoanalysis even. We need to see what happens once the limits are gone and everything is open because we are dealing with a given situation which needs to be maintained. And if it's being given up, if it's being dis disturbed, the whole system could collapse. I think in the next presentation we hear, we will consider even more details in this respect. The second aspect I would like to touch upon is the aspect of contemporaneity, which refers to the question of how do we perceive time? Do we consider time as a unilineal thing? And do we assume that there is only one course of time which we consider contemporary, thus modern? And what about the avant-garde in different respects and fields? We tend to overlook that, contrary to this general perception, there are many times which run in parallel, which mean that we also have to understand contemporaneity in a different way, because the contemporary also includes the past, because processes began in the past and are continuing today. So elements, objects which seem to be archaic in their origins cannot only be discussed with respect to the time they have come into being, but also with respect to their particular current meaning, with respect to the collective and the individual. So we are dealing with the contemporary in its time because art has never been the subject matter of a finished time. And maybe in those moments which are 
neither a beginning nor an end are the most intense ones. So we do need to see here to the dimension of the limit between what is art and what is not art. And then, of course, we are dealing with the political dimension of art, meaning in the first place, the images we see. I will show you a number of images which are clearly referring to people who were made invisible in order to clear them from the political and cultural maps. And this is not only referring to artists who produce works of art. It's referring to sectors in general where art is being made, often an art which opposes itself against the general trend, the mainstream. And here again, we need to draw a line to the second dimension I raised, i.e., contemporaneity. Now, the political aspect also refers to the way we present themes and we also refer to the way art produces the other images, these parallel realities which do exist within our reality and which allows for a questioning or a challenging of the truths we are being faced with, which is one of the privileges of the field of culture. And in this context, we need to see the museum because the canon always implies the possibility of an anti-canon. So no matter whether it's popular or illustrated, art is always discussing the very idea of the museum and the hegemonic canon in order to challenge what has been considered a truce in a time in which the world seems to be extremely polarized, and this goes for all countries, black or white, we are dealing with a situation which is very different from what we observed at the beginning of the century. And that's why art needs to fulfill or play a role, because art can never be the expression of the determined, the absolute, but it always has to raise questions. The pipe, which is not a pipe, which is not a pipe, is the very essence of these doubts. And art, as such, has to challenge its own conditionality in this field. And this is certainly one of the most interesting aspects of art, because art can open fields of suspicions. And art thus creates the reserves in which discussions can take place. Also, with respect to what has been considered a given. In other words, the canon has always a limit or always establishes its own its own limits in order to allow for the doubt and for the challenge, and this goes in particular for modern time or modern arts, because in this period, art has always been the first or among the first to challenge the truth of the 
institutions. In other words, art is facing its own limits all the time. Now, with respect to the canon, I would like to focus on the case of the um, traditional museum as it was set up in the 19th century, which is, so to speak, the um, very um, embodiment of what we could call the quintessential canon. It's a particular pattern imposed by the 19th century, which constitutes a quest for the universal universality of the illustrated model of beauty, i.e. it's about a universal approach also with respect to its own conditions of production and circulation or diffusion. This particular museum is an inherent element of the narrative of the modern museum with respect to its language and also with respect to the idea of an autonomous art. The autonomy of modern art, however, is a contradiction because art wants to change the world. However, there is always a certain form of the art, a certain uh, language of the art, which forms part of the autonomy of the art. And if we go back to Benjamin, we should also consider the possibility of the arts to go beyond the arts and yet consider the limits of which and within which art is a symbol or an icon. With respect to contemporary art, of course, we are also dealing with a particular discourse which implies the possibility of considering not only the world of art as such, but also the extra artistic world. The modern canon is, so to speak, established as a normative focus on language and is meant to determine the autonomy and superiority of the form in order to sanction as non-artistic any other different aesthetic regime. So we are dealing with a certain conflict. On the one hand, there is the autonomy of the art and its limit, and on the other hand, a need to discuss solve the limit and to, to, to play in view of the absence of limits and the presence of limits implies the crossover and the possibility to establish forms which are not definite forms but which come into being in which a particular formal configuration is being established. And that's also part of the political perspective. So the canon allows for diversity once diversity, however, not in terms of a general recognition of difference, but also in order to pro proliferate targets, the spectacular, the event, the exoticism, the organization of events which need to be fed and which need to be presented and hosted. So the particular critical sense of the artist is an aspect that matters here as well because the artist would not want 
art be dissolved on the market, become subject to a commercialization. So we are dealing with the normativity of the aesthetic form and the autonomy of the art, which at the same time is, however, controlled by the market, which is, however, a subject matter also on a global market. And here, in addition, technology and an event society or culture of event matters or plays a role. However, there are alternative options and there are also museums, even if at the margins that challenge this particular universal approach. We are also dealing with contingencies because the works of art, of course, tell their own history, but they are also constructs or works which are connected to societies, communities, and particular situations in this uh, process of merger. A work of art comes into being, which is a specific one, and it depends on its very site or location, and it exists within a certain period of time and is thus also determined or shaped by this particular period of time. And in this process, the museum plays an important role because it's the museum or the gallery where the work of art is being exhibited. And this is not only about these big parcels that, so to speak, represent culture or civilizations per se. This is also about articulations which work with respect to a particular position or a, a particular policy of a museum or concerning a given proposal. But let me tell you a bit about the Museo del Barro. It's the example I would like to use. However, I don't want to insinuate that here all problems have been solved, but I'm using the Museo del Barrio because that's the museum I know best because I've worked there for decades and also because it's an excellent case to show the diversity of modes adopted by certain museums of our times in order to not fall prey to the mainstream. It's a museum that shows contemporary art, popular art, which in certain countries, like, for example, Argentina or Paraguay or Chile or Brazil, is often seen as a kind of art apart. In other words, indigenous or mestizo works are considered popular art, and we do have a number of indigenous groups with their own politics, their own religions, who live in their own communities. And in Paraguay, for example, 90 percent of the population are mestizo. However, we are different from the indigenous tradition, which is rather shaped by a rural tradition and by a life in isolated communities. But anyway, indigenous and mestizo works are often seen as representations of popular art. These works, as well as the communities, are equally seen as marginal or isolated groups that work, but which do not benefit completely from the political, social, or cultural rights they own. They 
And this goes for Latin America as a whole, are subjects in a marginal position or in a marginalized position, because this is a particular structure you find in all Latin American societies. So the Museo del Barro includes the um, includes modern art, as it's called, or erudite art, but also what is called popular art. But both are represented on an equal basis. This is an important element of the program of the Museo del Barro. And here you see a number of masks, objects of um, campesino art, which are being exhibited important ceramics from uh, Paraguay on the one hand and then contemporary art on the other hand. As you can see, both are shown in the museum. Now, in most countries where you find indigenous uh, popular art, you see a major difference between the erudite culture of the given country and the popular culture and what you see in Asuncion, Buenos Aires, Caracas or even Berlin is often arranged according to a particular a code of perception, which actually is more or less the same for all works, whereas there is a much greater differentiation made when it comes to popular art. Here you see, again, examples from the indigenous art galleries in the Museo del Barro. Now, it's very important to have indigenous communities involved in the reconstruction, but also in the exhibition of these works. This is actually about negotiating, because often indigenous people are not necessarily interested in the museum per se or as such, but of course they are very interested in the recognition of their culture and civilization and they want to be protected and that's why we also have adopted a number of political statements to this in this respect. These are works, suits produced by indigenous communities. This particular costume was shown in Valencia in the context of uh, contemporary art. But when I suggested that it be shown there, people said, well, this is actually different from contemporary art because it's been used. And I said, that's the very reason why we should consider it contemporary art, because it has its use in a contemporary period of the past, but still today because it's still being used in rituals. We also have a number of archaeological pieces in um, the Museo del Barrio, which are then, of course, not part of this contemporary art approach. But um, we also have a number of uh, sites outside of uh, Asuncion. Well, we try to focus on the possibility of solving the problems of contemporary art as a whole. And this is, by the way, the reason why I am showing these pictures to you. One of the most important conflicts of contempor contemporary art is 
how to approach a given form of beauty if you remain a prisoner of this particular form or beauty. Any art which fulfills a function which has a purpose is not art. Normally, art is what does not fulfill a certain purpose. And this is also an element of the idea of the autonomy of art. But then, if we talk about the autonomy of art, we also have to talk about the post-autonomy of art, i.e. a much more pragmatic approach and the use of objects. The question is, however, how do we preserve or protect art, which is a powerful expression of form and beauty and the use of the letter in order to not have the work of art lose its social function. Of course, we are dealing here with a much more intense form. Here, you see a crown of a chief or a warrior, and as you can see, this is a powerful expression of beauty, and it reminds you certainly of the crowns worn by monarchs in the Western tradition or bishops, priests. And at the same time, you see the condensation of uh, forms. These uh, pieces are still being used by community leaders. For example, as you can see here on the picture, there is a group of leaders of the community who meet um, the senior judge at the Supreme Court of the country. So these are objects which are beautiful and eternal, and they're still being used. Here you see a rural ritual representing the battle, because, of course, there have always been um, antagonisms of ethnic groups, but also um, fights between women and men. And the old rituals or traditions are being reenacted today. Of course, the forms here are much stronger or much more powerful than the function. It's uh, therefore not a purpose as such what is enshrined in the object. Here, another picture showing um, a contemporary costume, certainly of indigenous and colonial origin, but used today, still today, in popular uh, festivities and celebrations. And of course, this is also something which has to do with imagination, with fantasies, with um, a very powerful aesthetic um, expression. The political question is certainly also an aspect in the focus of the Museo del Barro, in particular with respect to the claims made by indigenous communities, with respect to their autonomy or self-determination, but also with respect to the right of education and the right to land. They ask for 
Western educational programs, but they want to choose. They don't want to have the government oblige them to participate in certain uh, courses, but they want to decide what they study, sociology or whatever. And these programs are therefore also supported by the museum. It's, it's not the museum that offers these programs as such, but we do support these programs. And here you see a picture of a community talking about political autonomy. Sometimes it's seminars and theoretical circles. And there we talk about the alternative canon or forms of the colonization of the museum. Lots of questions which are quite similar to the questions you normally raise in this type of seminars. And of course, there's also support for indigenous groups, political groups who demand land. Here you see a representative of a of an indigenous community claiming his land in front of the parliament building and his face in his face, he wears the colors of war. It's a symbolic war. And again here, we see the re recovery of traditional colors and patterns. And this implies that there is a certain category categorization of forms, patterns, and colors used in order to express anger or sadness or protest. This is a symbolic war which is being waged here. One of the most important questions for which indigenous people fight is the question of the territory of land. We have huge forests. We had, I need to say, in Paraguay, there were huge forests. But as you can see, due to mon monoculture, and rigid farming, lots of forests have gone lost in spite of the fact that these are fundamental for the survival of indigenous groups. And this is why these groups organize protests. They, These are peaceful demonstrations, protest marches, but the colors and the patterns in the faces show their anger and their protest. And this is meant to underline the political dimension of their action. And then, of course, we also need to consider another aspect when it comes to the question of contemporaneity here, we see certain forms. Technically spoken, these are indigenous forms, and at the same time, they are contemporary. We see Julia Sidres. Here, she's a very popular artist, and she's very creative, and her works are being sold in La Paz, in Santiago de Chile, in Madrid, and are shown in exhibitions of contemporary art. And here, we see a shaman who um, shows all the patterns of his tradition. And he is also dressed in a very traditional way. It seems to be a pre-Columbine um, costume even, because we do not see any reference to a Western society. And yet, these costumes, these dresses um, are still being produced today. This is a modern picture. And we do find these um, shamans or these people still today and they are 
made up and dressed and equipped with the feathers like the men you see on the picture. And of course, these are items they use in order to underline the words they speak or in order to help with the magic they do. They heal the sick and others. Now, when analyzing the system of the other or the otherness of the museum, the different and what is on the other side, we usually consider the matrix of the colony and we ask how has the object survived colonial times. Here we see a bench of a shaman. And this is the Wanani ideal. You see, we also know many other examples which look different. But here you see a very simplified and synthetic and sober approach. It's a very simple device, slightly curved, which gives a lot of energy to the piece, which is often used by the shamanes Guarani. Here you see an example of Spanish Baroque style, which is very different in its canon from indigenous, from the indigenous style. It's very dynamic. It's full of curves. It's um, exaggerated, abundant. And it's a clear opposition which you see in this particular figure copied by the Guarani in opposition against this abundant, exaggerated representation of the Spanish Baroque style. It's very symmetrical, it's frontal, it's linear. And it's very different. And this is what we know from today. It's the Virgin made by a by an indigenous community. It's meant to be the image of the Virgin. And this image again shows the very simplified approach. It's a very brutal and direct and schematic approach. And you also find examples of uh, contemporary, contemporary popular art, which again plays with the idea of the Baroque style, however, in a much more simplified, much more linear way this uh, item avoids any element or insinuate, insinuation of movement. There are also other examples like this one, which shows that rituals are being maintained and the dresses or costumes which go along with the rituals, like these um, pre-Columbine tunics. And the female costume, for example, shows that the women also are recovering a position which used to be a, an exclusively male one, the Chiriganos, for example, where you see a postmodern multicultural mix in the costume and in the hats. In other words, the cultures, the civilizations are not being destroyed or lost, lost, but they become objects in a process of transculturalization and lead to completely new forms, like, for example, 
an indigenous sketch. In, in, in the past, traditionally, indigenous communities did not sketch at all. Thank you very much for listening. David T. continues with the lecture Unframing the Nation, Paragon and Radical Allegory, so more unframing, is an incisive analysis on the ambiguities, tensions, inversions, and critique of the spatial, graphical, and ontological frame of the nation through the contemporary artistic practice by several artists such as Rikriti Ravanilla, Arin Jungang, and Achita Punk. Please uh, uh, help me to welcome David Te after I introduce him. David Te is a writer, curator, and researcher based in the National University of Singapore, specialized in Southeast Asian contemporary art. Among other projects, he has curated transmission uh, at the Jim Thompson Art Center in Bangkok in 2014. And he's also a director of the Future Project, a gallery and project platform in Singapore. Welcome, David. Thank you, Paz. A canonical text is one that's become sacred, a touchstone shared by all subsequent authors in a given place or tradition. I'm going to cast some doubt on the sanctity of an art historical canon in Thailand, uh, but I, I wanted to start on a surer footing. Architecture might have offered that, uh, but my expertise falls short. With narrative, however, we're on somewhat firmer ground. Thailand's uh, urtext, if you like, a national myth, the Ramakian, is a version of the Hindu epic, the Ramayana, brought to Siam by Indian traders in the 8th or 9th century, then localized over a thousand years, largely under royal imperative as by the first king of the present Bangkok dynasty called Rama I, after the Ramakian's hero, and his son, the second Rama, in their rebuilding of Siam after its defeat by the Burmese in 1767, with the possible exception of the Jataka, or the stories of the lives of the Buddha. No other story is as canonical. Not only has it given its narrative to the architecture of social life, it also provided an architecture uh, of narrative per se across all figurative and historical traditions, oral, literary, performative, as well as visual. But if I speak of a canon, it's important to remember uh, that this architecture was furnished not by nation as such, but by a dynasty. One prophesied, not incidentally, to come to an end with its current ninth reign will return to this terminus. For now, let me note briefly a few things about this canon narrative. One, it has no author, at least its supposed 4th century BC author Valmiki has been all but eclipsed by those who have commissioned the recension of the text. These quasi authors are sovereign. Two, that it's an origin, but there's no fixed or authoritative version. Its authority consists rather in reiteration, and to that extent, it's alive and responsive to the present. Thirdly, from the point of view of modern nationalists, it's marked in every dimension by otherness, geographic, ethnic, religious, linguistic, but is nevertheless properly and indisputably Thai. Now, I've just written a book about Thai contemporary art, um, and I realize I haven't given nearly enough thought to questions of canonization. Um, the, the chapter that I'll remix today uh, would definitely benefit from that reflection, and I'm grateful to Anselm and Paz for, for the opportunity. The terms in which the question of the canon has been asked here, and surely it can only be put in this day and age in question and as a question, present me nevertheless with a dilemma. Not only would it be difficult for me, and alienating for you, to identify a canon proper to that place, but one would also stray quickly into the question of canonicity, its conditions of possibility, if you like. Questions which, while interesting in a general way, would be more about socio-historical specifics than the entanglements between Thai art and a wider world. So let me displace slightly the question of a canon in favor of another which is philosophically fundamental to it, for Foucault certainly, that of limits. 
and I have in mind here uh, a preface to transgression rather than a history of madness, um, of, of a relation then to the limit in the most abstract sense that would define both the amplitude of art and the sovereignty of the artist with respect to both arts outside uh, a public discourse, posterity, etc., and to its inside, its forms, the, the limits of the work. In both respects, we'd be asking not about the separation of included from excluded, from within from without, but rather about that which is neither exactly inside nor outside, a limit that's neither of the work, properly speaking, nor quite outside of it, a site designated by Jacques Derrida, some of you will recall, as the frame or paragon. Now today I'll be refer referring to four artists in some detail. I just want to plot very briefly uh, their positions with respect to a putative national canon. All are Thais who have won national accolades. Two are graduates of the National Art Academy, but none of them really belongs to a national canon. Three have received the mid-career Silipaton Award. The fourth, Arin, uh, did a national pavilion in Venice in 2013, but none are national artists, capital N, capital A. The more prestigious anointment conferring a monthly pension, health benefits, and generous provision for one's death in the form of a funerary biography. They made their names just too late for Apinan's seminal 1992 scholarly art history. None has had a retrospective in the academy or in Bangkok's other municipal institutions. In the absence of national collections, only a few of their works, not their most important, have been collected in Thailand by private patrons. While outside Thailand, all have entered major public collections. The list would include MoMA, Guggenheim, Tate, the French Fonds National, uh, others in Spain, Japan, Hong Kong. Apichatpong is the only Southeast Asian with a palm door from Khan. RAR and Arin are somewhat less collected, but are in important regional collections in Australia, Singapore, and elsewhere. So their canonicity then has two distinct essential facets. Though recognized at home and abroad, they're only admitted to the outside canon of the advanced capitalist world. Maybe the two facets negatively define one another, and certainly casting an eye across the national pantheon, artists with both state institutional plaudits and Thai market currency, say, one doesn't find too many conceptualist noodle chefs, nor queer cineasts, nor post-minimalist installation makers, nor female necromancers. By the same token, one is surprised to find any of Thailand's living national artists uh, in any significant public collection outside Thailand. So we're talking about parallel worlds. There is no continuum, no striated field of cannons to be folded and massaged into smoothness. Instead of anticipating some assimilation, we're on more solid ground treating them as discrete systems. And if we seek limits, then those limits may be interior to each. Is it too soon to talk of canons? These four are still circling in the goldfish bowl of the contemporary. Certainly the written record is patchy. Yet this can't be put down to the dispersion of the canon apparatus in the era of arts globalization. For their evasion of a certain written enregistrement is neither accidental nor incidental. They may even deliberately thwart the engines of canonization. Thus, Rukrit, who's by no means averse to text, tends to upset the institutional pedestal with cocktail recipes, sci-fi biographies, theatrical doublings, and charismatic withdrawals. In 1998, a substantial book was published on Rukrit's work. Cloth bound and weighing two pounds, Supermarket summarized his previous work as he was nearing 40, about the age that a rising art star might be looking for a mid-career retrospective. But the exhibitions that occasioned it in Zurich, Amsterdam, Dijon, and Columbus, Ohio, didn't really amount to one. Nor is the book quite an exhibition catalog, for like many of Rickert's productions, it evinces a resistance to art world packaging. Formal interventions abound reflexive tweaks, anticipating subverting readers' expectations of the retrospective monograph. 
Instead, an art historical, uh, sorry, instead of art historical essays, uh, a miscellany of brief personal anecdotes and reflections from a host of Rickrit's art world friends, mapping obliquely the institutional and social networks that connect them. If anything, its format, in keeping with its title, is that of the cookbook or shopping list. The texts are divided by six tranches of full color photographic plates, each section corresponding to a key ingredient of his practice. They are food, home, a lot of people, saffron, market, and moving. Now the images have been subjected to a special design strategy. Many are large, bled to the edges of the page, others diminutive, snapshots sh shrunken to thumbnail size or tiled to make abstract wallpaper. Some have been paired and duplicated, one nested within the other, then reversed, a system sure to frustrate uh, the gallerists or the publishers' preference for the money shot. As a relational artist, Rickard is famed for the inclusive and participatory nature of his work. And this photo survey reaches most corners of the contemporary art world and features many of its constituents. One context does tend to bleed into the next, though, for with the exception of page numbers, metadata has been assiduously removed from the layout, with caption info instead compiled in an annex at the back. But two photographs at the dead center of this book defy all the rules. Both show Thailand's long reigning monarch, King Bumipon Adunyaded, on tour at the fringes of his realm. At this time, Rukrit, the son of a diplomat born in Argentina, educated in North America, had begun to connect more deliberately with his Thai heritage. If his identity is a preoccupation of the book, it's not a matter the book would resolve, but rather the fulcrum of a singular ambivalence. And it's saffron, the most specific yet the least literal of these ingredients, that at the center of the book frames this uncertain inheritance. Here we find distinctively Thai scenes, not touristic stereotypes, though some come close, but rather a kind of minor picturesque, glimpses of everyday life on which the eye of a longer term visitor might linger. The color of saffron is of course synonymous with the Buddhist monkhood, and Rekrit's subscription to that faith was to become a keynote of critical and not so critical reckonings with his work. Where monks are not pictured, they are implied by the chromatic signature of their robes. But the contexts are profane and quotidian, not sacred. In fact, in a subtle recursive symmetry, the settings map the other five ingredients of Rickrit's hitherto quite secular practice. At the knotty heart of this national symbolic riddle, without a hint of saffron, we find our two photos of King Bumipon. In the first, attended by military aides, he inspects rice fields in Me Salong at the country's northern extremity in 1979. The second finds him in the so-called Deep South the following year, looking more relaxed, inspecting a map and conversing with locals in a village near Sungai Kolok. These sites represent the very fingertips of what Tongchai Winichakun calls Thailand's geobody the furthest point from its symbolic and political heart in Bangkok. Indeed, ethnographically, there's nothing very Siamese or Buddhist about either of them, and Thai sovereignty has been disputed in both places, under arms, in living memory. In the latter, it still is. The photos seem to have been lifted from some royal commemorative volume, complete with dated bilingual captions which report His Majesty's movements without naming him as if part of a larger series. They're neither nested nor tiled, neither re reproduced nor reduced. Each gets its own double page color spread framed by a slim white border. Why the special treatment? These are the only images in a, a, a richly illustrated tome of some 300 pages to be exempt from what is otherwise a rigorous reflexive design rubric. The only images not subject to this carefully unconventional, unconventional framing of an artist's oeuvre are images of the sovereign. And what underscores the exception, what inscribes it, 
are precisely conventions of framing, suggesting deference to institutional order in a book that deliberately sets out to defy and scramble institutional formatting. The only images, it seems, that, can, that cannot do without their metadata or their frame. For an ethnically Thai artist rediscovering his roots, but better known in the West, more engaged with Euro-American traditions, it's hard to avoid the conclusion that this exception marks some kind of limit. It attests to the existence of a field of images lying beyond the would-be global language games of conceptual art, a genre that's modern yet sacrosanct, subject to a sovereign exception. This anxious gesture summons all the tensions I would assemble here under the sign of the Paragon. In The Truth in Painting, Derrida shows that the delineation instituted by a framing might be more than just spatial or graphical, but also ontological, neither of the work nor foreign to it, neither inside nor outside. The Paragon, quote, stands out both from the ergon, the work, and from the milieu. End quote. This describes such hors d'oeuvres as the drape, the clothing on a statue, or captions. For the moving image, to which I'll turn in a moment, it could include subtitles, credits, soundtrack, or for art more broadly, the whole theatre of exhibition, the discursive framings of promotion and curatorship, of collecting and, ex and exhibiting institutions. This paragon, which disconcerts the opposition between inside and outside, has phenomenological implications for works of art. Yet as they enter a vigorous but uneven global exchange, might there also be ramifications at the level of a more properly political ontology, at the uncertain borders of an ethno-national being. Now, sovereignty isn't just a matter for individuals, but also for the collective, a shared autonomy typically vested in the nation. But while for the peripatetic global individual, national belonging might bear the promise of a reassuringly steady frame, globalization is just as dis disconcerting for the nation itself, which is reframed with new uncertainties. Against these, nations regroup into regional formations, pooling their economic powers. But the greater the disparities and disagreements, the less effective they are as a group. Modern Southeast Asia was never a model of cohesion. It began as a figment of the colonial military imagination, British, Japanese, then American, and later of Western academic area studies under similarly uh, imperialist pretexts. Today, it's largely a top-down bureaucratic construct, and for the majority of its inhabitants, Southeast Asia has had little meaning or impact on everyday life. In a recent opinion piece in Singapore's Straits Times, an economist reports on the ASEAN economic community, the regional plan adopted in 2007, aiming for freer movement of goods, services, labor, capital. The writer is frank about the challenges, I quote, Singapore is a services-based economy. Brunei is oil-based. Malaysia and Thailand are fast industrializers. Thailand and Vietnam are big agricultural exporters. Indonesia and the Philippines are net food importers. Cambodia, Laos and Myanmar are still agrarian. The policy landscape is accordingly mottled from the free port of Singapore, where the value of trade equals some 400% of GDP, to newly opened Myanmar where it's just 31%. Even for the most ardent free marketeers, it's hard to see past the obstacles to integration. In the wake of financial meltdown in the late 90s, anthropologist Aiwa Ong anticipated this as the region repositioned itself, encouraged by the IMF, to court multinational capital. She saw a transformation of sovereignty which for her still rested on a discrimination interior to the state, as in earlier authoritarian and colonial regimes. But the inclusive nationalisms of the decolonization period were giving way to what she calls gradation, a spectrum of citizenship patterned to plug diverse populations into an exterior web of multinational corporate power. Sovereignty has less to do with the citizen-state relationship, more to do with one's valence in transnational labor markets. 
and transnational media, says Ong, play a special role. They represent not only subjects, albeit unequally, but also the global itself and doubly as vehicles of the orbital trade in information and as ideological champions of the connectedness that it entails. Media not only reflect the architecture of graduated sovereignty, but also construct it. They frame the graduated subject, even as they destabilize, like a paragon, earlier oppositions between inside and outside. If global media affect a sovereign framing, they also permit sovereign disruption. The so-called social web is at once the site of global convergence and a resurgence of national policing. Some nations find ways to dampen its effects. China censors search engines. Thailand prosecutes bloggers and YouTube users under its draconian Les Majeste law. Mindful of the web's power as a political theater, the military junta, having banned all political assembly, I'm talking about the present, has even banned the reading of books and the eating of sandwiches in public, two tropes of silent protest against their 2014 coup d'etat. Digital video commands a special currency in this mediascape. Yet if there are gains to be made by a democratic medium, supposedly democratic medium, they'll be made not in the national game of representation, but in the seduction and engagement of external transnational interests and pressures. Ong's reframed sovereignty describes well a national economy in multinational context, but the matter doesn't end there. For while Thailand's modern liberal economy exemplifies global integration, its insular polity and the sovereignty that defines it belong to another order. And this disconnect between economic and political sovereignty may not be unique to Thailand, but its effects are more keenly felt and repressed in a populace so mixed, a people long beholden to ethnic myths of independence, a nation in the midst of an acute crisis of sovereignty. The period since 1997 has been one of great uncertainty for Thailand, but while it has as much to lose or gain as from the AEC as, as any of its neighbors do, it finds neither strength nor purpose in this reframing. Most Thais prefer to see their country as part of a larger, though not very detailed, world map. And this stems from Siam's pre-modern status as a big fish in a small pond. Not since the golden age of Angkor, this is the 10th to 12th centuries, has it looked sideways for benchmarks of culture or development. From the 14th century, the Siamese crown in Ayutthaya sent tribute to China, but seldom recognized its neighbors. Most educated Thais know that the former capital was a bustling port with many foreign communities, but they'd be surprised to find that its lingua franca was Malay. The orientation shifted in the 19th century, finding powerful models of civilization in Europe, later uh, in the US and Japan. If Thailand was slow to recognize itself in the national logo map, it has little picture of what surrounds it. If it did, the resemblance would surely be discomforting, since so many of its traditions are borrowed. But the absorption of provincial and neighboring cultures continues an even older process that began with living bodies and their material surplus, labor and rice. All the classical states of mainland Southeast Asia came about through the concentration of labor from elsewhere for paddy cultivation. Their glory and expiry were indices of the surplus of this one grain. They were, as James Scott explains, polyglot populations. Their cultures, I quote him, works in progress, sums of the various peoples who chose to identify with them or were incorporated by force. As integration was a strategic necessity, assimilation was easy, identity a matter of performance rather than birth a principle no less axiomatic in the modern era. Belonging was neither absolute nor permanent, but rather temporary and contingent. Scott's anarchist history of the upland fringes of these states is not about pristine autonomous elsewheres, but about continuous negotiation, ingenious techniques and cultures of resistance, unthinkable without the sedentary valley dwellers on whom these people depended for trade, technology, and protection. 
Modernity only refreshed these dynamics of appropriation and resistance as diverse peoples were subsumed under the idea of nation. If this centralizing versus fugitive dynamic has informed the distribution of people and power, it has also structured thought and expression. So the questions raised by Scott are as pressing for art history as for political science. What forms of autonomy or sovereignty might have survived the process of encompassment? How might they have shaped the moral and intellectual geography of the modern geo-body? And what of these dynamics may still be observed in contemporary life and art? National identification was pivotal in Thai modern arts becoming contemporary. As a hybrid of local and foreign discourses, it always expressed the aspirations and the anxieties of national subjectivity. But if it admitted some progressive tendencies, since the 1970s, it has gone the other way, becoming more moralistic and less interested in the society around it. It, busied, it has busied itself with increasingly vapid expressions of an inner cultural essence, which ironically then became the official prop of an outward ideological projection. National identity was a currency of the contemporary, but turned out to be a compromising one. The alternative across Southeast Asia, I'll generalize here in an iconographic way, uh, the alternative was allegory, the masking of political critique by way of codes and metaphors. This happens wherever political power takes authoritarian forms, and that means everywhere in this region. In Indonesia, it was already salient in the mid-1970s as a new art movement. Uh, for example, FX Hasono uh, pictured here. Um, but by the 90s, through the Though the, sorry, although the region's authoritarianisms had softened, this allegorical mode was well entrenched. Ambiguity was still necessary in many places, including, for example, paternalist Singapore. Thailand saw its, share, its fair share of critical allegories too, as in the videos and performances of uh, Wasan City Ket, uh, the interactive inflatables of uh, Suti Kunawichianon, just to choose two examples. More common, however, was withdrawal into personal experience, negative individualism, spun as a positive cultivation of self, embracing either Buddhist teachings or everyday life or both, especially for a kind of hypermobile cohort that found ample opportunities abroad under the banner of so-called relational aesthetics. Elsewhere, I've analyzed this withdrawal and its currencies, curatorial, formal, conceptual, and its sometimes troubling historical associations. While they downplayed their identity and set aside the symbols of official nationalism, these orbital artists instead enshrined vernacular ones. Now this reframing complicates an earlier fixation on identity as they move beyond national symbolism Critique becomes implicit and ambiguous, embedded in form and process, and often lost in translation. Indeed, the most incisive takes on national experience lay in the most cryptic works, as we'll see, by artists who subjected the frame itself, the paragon, to formal agitation, volatilizing the order of representation. In Thailand's fraught political context, they were not engaged political subjects, but rather withdrawing sovereign ones, and thus all the more deeply implicated in the country's symbolic crisis. I'll return in a moment to this negative individualism. The few instances of positive individualism have had a confounding potency, but did nothing for an artist's prospects of canonization especially where they brought personal life into public view. Discretion is a cardinal virtue in Thailand, and no artist has tested that norm more than Araya Ratam Riansuk. Having trained in printmaking at the National Academy, in the 80s, Araya worked in, metaphoric, in, a, in a metaphorical surrealist mode, which the art historian John Clark has described as a convenient deflection from politics. Two stints at the Hochschule in Braunschweig saw her move 
confidently into installation, probing neglected issues such as gender roles and the exploitation of rural women in Thailand's massive sex industry. But by the 90s, an engagement with video was yielding RAR's most compelling work, a departure from allegory in favor of direct encounters with social reality. As a woman and non-conformist, RAR faced limitations. As a student, she was barred from pursuing sculpture, a medium deemed unsuitable for women. But her talents didn't go unrecognized. She's had many solo shows at the National Gallery uh, and participated in regional surveys in Japan, Australia, a national pavilion in Venice. Uh, her inclusion in documentary in 2012 and solo shows in New York since suggest enduring international appeal. Indeed, she holds many of the currencies of Thailand's relational vanguard. She moved to Chiang Mai in the 80s. Like them, she eschewed official Thainess, instead finding inspiration in her local surroundings and everyday life, as you see here. Yet she has not enjoyed the same stature as her male peers, either within Thailand or beyond. One reason is her literary inclination. She draws constantly on literary and oral traditions, uh, and is also an accomplished writer of poetry and criticism. This has not been to her advantage. Colleagues are wary of this competency, which is still considered quite alien to the modern artist's métier. Especially provocative was her adoption of the male pronoun pom. Even more divisive, her abiding associations with, with society's others. Inmates of a, of a women's mental asylum, stray dogs, animals awaiting slaughter in an abattoir, and most famously, unclaimed corpses in a local mortuary with whom she staged performances and conversations for video. The socialization of bare life is taboo in Thailand's conformist, Buddhist, and highly gendered public culture. Confronting enough in the West, at home it was inflammatory. It's hard to characterize RAR as a withdrawing artist in any way. Although in step with some trends in the 90s, her trajectory was atypical. Unlike her orbital peers, she could never be characterized as a post-medium or post-studio artist. Her success, rather, lay in sustained explorations of media, especially the moving image, one that has been fertile for, for reckonings with marginal others, and thus for the unframing of national subjectivity. So I hope you'll permit me then a quick detour into the moving image. In the aftermath of the 2014 coup with Bangkok under martial law, Thailand's throttled media reported in a single day three stories reflecting the role of the moving image in the definition of national community. First, the army paid off listed entertainment group, RS, to secure the live broadcast of the FIFA World Cup finals on free-to-air TV channels, including army-owned Channel 5. The company had fended off months of legal attack by the state, but eventually surrendered its rights and half its revenue after intervention by the generals, who announced the company's cooperation as a victory in their campaign to return happiness to the people, a campaign that is ongoing today. Meanwhile, a screening of the 1984 adaptation of Orwell's 1984 at a bookstore in Chiang Mai, a stronghold of the Shinawat clan, uh, this is the, one of the deposed prime ministers and their red shirt supporters, was called off after police intimidation. The organizer's demurral was wise. Having dissolved the parliament and rescinded the constitution, the junta was smothering any form of protest with acts as innocuous as the eating of sandwiches considered dangerously unpatriotic. A third story reported that as part of the junta's campaign, cinemas countrywide would be giving away free tickets to The Legend of King Naresuan 5, the latest in a series of bloated royalist propaganda films about a 16th century king directed by minor princeling and veteran cineast Chatri Chalom Yukon. But despite the controls on dissent, howls of protest were heard from provinces lacking cinemas and thus excluded from the giveaways. These episodes prove the enduring potency of the moving image as an ideological state apparatus. The same factors have retarded modern art, moral policing by the state, 
the chauvinist symbolic fantasies of the palace, compliance of corporate sector and bureaucracy. Only the instrumentalization of film is more avid and certainly of more use. Thailand's underdeveloped provinces are not heard crying out for museums. All this is nothing new. The first Naresuan film in 2007 was partly bankrolled by the Queen and the Army. Its $20 million budget set a, a national record. The royal clan has long supported cinema. Take Ernest Schoedsack and Marion Cooper's extraordinary 1927 film, Chang, backed by Chatri Chalom's grandfather, a son of the fifth king and half-brother of the sixth. The moving image is an important vehicle of national identification, but also therefore carries a certain danger. Indeed, it's exemplary of Southeast Asia's mixed modernity. While embraced throughout the region, it's been cracked in myriad ways, mobilized, detourné, tropicalized in conjunction and competition with local art forms. But if it symbolized the new, it often served old powers, old stories, and old ways of doing things. Hence, both its appeal and its threat to the state, a form whose constitutive anxieties have turned on precisely such articulations of new order in the terms of the old. Now, cinema's deployment has tended to streamline both the audience and the appeal of an art with transcultural ambitions. And by emphasizing technical development, histories of national cinema have insulated industrial film from its low-tech but highly competent precursors and competitors. And I'm suggesting that a study of the latter and their paragon may do better justice to the moving image and its layered contexts. Now I'm going to skip uh, one section. New media enable new engagements with local, oral, and pre-cinematic cultures. They also cast new light on local peculiarities within the cinema's mainstream. Film historian May Ingawanit uh, investigates the longevity of live dubbing and 16 millimeter in Thailand through the Cold War. The local industry worked in local ways with the already superseded apparatus. Movies were shot fast on unsealed sets and silent, decades after sync sound recording had become the norm elsewhere. The versionists, as they were called, often became stars in their own right. This was how film was introduced to most of the Thai population. Dubbing was often the responsibility of a traveling projectionist, at once technological adept and vector of the modern, but also inheritor of theatre traditions and all the framing that went with them. What kind of community was inscribed within the spaces of this modern art form? This variable, permeable, live cinema gave a distinct flavour even to the national corporate matrix. Uh, Ingawanit notes the popularity of Hindi films, for example, in the 1960s, uh, which were well suited to local voicing. Older intercultural resonance, here's the Ramayana again, did a lot to shape the cinema in even the US-dominated post-war era, in places happily behind the curve of spectacular innovation. Now, the versionist cinema framed a new sub-national and even transnational public. As digital media make the production and dissemination of films cheaper and faster, they also lower barriers to circulation, breaking the monopoly that institutions once, once held over translation and captioning. Massive informal peer-to-peer -peer markets connect users across borders in languages other than their mother tongues. Add to this the residues of colonial language and global English, and it's little wonder that video makers have identified the subtitle as a special site for aesthetic play, an unstable paragon at the edges of ethno-national belonging. For example, Marut Lekpet's elliptical Burmese man dancing, dwelling on Thai stereotypes about Burmese migrant workers, solicited by way of a questionnaire. Two frames, black and white split screen, show scenes from the decks of fishing boats in the working harbour of Phuket. Close shots of nautical paraphernalia alternate with wider ones. The voices of fishermen are heard above the engines, but they're not pictured. Subtitles, meanwhile, drawn from the questionnaire responses, appear below the frames, but in an encoded, unreadable language. 
A few samples appear after the film with the credits in Thai and English. Now, the, the title of this work points to a significant but marginalised minority, both a legitimate menial underclass and a standing reserve of exploited sans-papier. The precarity of their situation was underscored after the 2006 coup and since. Fluctuations in the fishing industry and crackdowns by the Thai authorities have sent torrents of Burmese and Khmer, uh, an undocumented population of millions, spilling across the frontiers. Meanwhile, the Thai Navy has been busted for towing stateless Rohingya refugees out to sea and setting them adrift. More intriguing for me, however, were the artist's formal gestures, which in fact undermine the conventions by which such issues would normally take the form of moving images. The Burmese man never appears, his voice is all but drowned out. While the footage is observational, any transparency is troubled by the double frame, reminding us of the inadequacy of either viewpoint and the world that they exclude. Sound, too, fails us. The engines muffle the workers' voices with any hope of understanding dashed by the subtit subtitles. Marut puts all viewers equally on the outside. So comprehension here demands not translation, but additional framing, the credits and synopsis, or that variable in framing that's the work of the curator. But even these don't guarantee smooth communication. Rather, Marut's subtitles excommunicate certain normative viewers in the name of underrepresented others, outsiders within the geobodies of modern nations. And the frame, neither inside nor outside the work, short circuits representation. Now, I began by highlighting an insecurity in the national framing sought by an internationally recognized ethnically Thai artist. In its cautious pursuit of Thainess, Rukrit's catalogue imbued the nation with a spiritual tint, yet one that was germane to the profane global everyday his art typically engages. But insofar as this vision then inframes the walking, breathing embodiment of nation, Tynus in its most exemplary figure, its properly sovereign form, and pictured in the very act of encompassment, we saw that a special distinction, a special paragon, was called for. Of all the places on contemporary art's map, there can be few where such an accommodation would be necessary, especially for an artist of Rukrit's stature. Now, it's little wonder that in the decades since, artists disillusioned by Thailand's political failure have avoided the stereotypes on which their seniors often traded, favoring generic mass-produced forms over the symbols of state, faith, and royalty nor that their more conceptual work, while embraced abroad, received scant attention at home. Born in the 70s amidst social conflict, this generation, this younger generation, graduated in the 90s, the late 90s, a window of opportunity as financial crisis clarified art's social calling, and Thai art was finding its place on a burgeoning international circuit. But the horizon soon darkened, with Thaksin's mastery of the electoral system and the royalists' desperate campaign to unseat him. Since the 2006 coup, the political calamity has only deepened. The dangers of instrumentalization have never been so acute. Just one month after the bloody 2010 crackdown on red shirt protesters by an appointed premier, Apisit Wechachiwa, in which nearly 100 were slain, a massive and incoherent exhibition was held at the Bangkok Art and Culture Center in the heart of a city brought to a standstill by the conflict. Imagine peace was an unabashedly political exercise, an awkward simulation of national unity dominated by weak pseudo-political art. Within it, however, was a small subsection, very deftly curated by Rukrit, that threw this younger generation's ambivalence into stark relief. Rukrit's reputation for generosity is very well founded. His support for other artists has been conscientious and decisive in more than a few careers. But his involvement was a surprise to some, for it signaled not only complicity with an ideologically dubious state venture, but responsibility for instrumentalizing others. 
It might pass for collegiality in the egalitarian scenes of Berlin or New York, but we'd be naive to think that his role could be similar in Thailand's stratified and sectarian one. This was more a performance of patronage than anything else, and patrons need clients. Rickrit brought into the institutional fold a cohort that would otherwise have stayed on the sidelines. Many of the pieces in this section were pre-existing works with no reference to the political strife. The more suggestive ones reflected the darkened climate. Perhaps the most subtly coded was by Arin Rungjang, who salvaged synthetic carpets from the museum storeroom, which he drew into a slumping pyramid hitched to an internal pillar. Now, I juxtapose this with a photo taken outside the BACC a month earlier as red shirts barricaded the intersection protesting the sabotage of, selected, uh, of successive elected governments. Arin's carpets may be a metaphor for the civic collapse that prompted the exhibition, but they have a, an even more nuanced story to tell. Though owned and funded by the city, the BACC's first exhibition, 2008, was a photography show by Princess, Princess Sirindhorn, the king's popular second daughter. Then came a blockbuster of Tynus, Traces of Siamese Smile. Along with these shows came a string of inaugurations, crowds of bureaucrats parading their love for king and country, with art coming in a distant third. Arin's carpets had seen a lot of action. His piece was spontaneous, although characteristic of his practice in many ways. Yet what seems to be a kind of anti-materialism, or at least it's a non-objective uh, sort of work, uh, is perhaps not so anti-materialist. The artworks are there, but they tend to merge. I'm referring to several of his previous works as well. They tend to merge with the architectural paragon that frames them, tracing and resurfacing floors, ceilings, and walls and surfaces in Thailand can have extraordinary amplitude. Before becoming a makeshift sculpture, the carpets had served two functions, both of them prophylactic. They'd staved off the wear and tear of the new infrastructure and allowed some near celestial visitors to grace the galleries without touching the ground. But the social pyramid, uh, sorry, I've skipped a bit there. By repurposing the symbolic scaffolding of patronage, Arin implicitly jumbles the social pyramid over which they preside. He brings into focus the symbolic economy on which the institution depends, illuminating the folds between sovereign and bureaucratic power, where the two embrace, supposedly without touching. These events, this kind of carpet, could equally be found in any institution in Southeast Asia. One might find similar parochial national surveys, though probably not so soon after civil conflict. But perhaps only in Thailand can such nondescript materials emit such profound anxieties. Cryptic and ambiguous, the work irritates the sovereign distinction by appropriating not its symbols, but its residues in everyday life, not its figure, but only the skin that had momentarily framed its performance of patronage and encompassment. Now, what might such works tell us about the fraught transformations of sovereignty? And what of art's purchase on these processes? Thai modern art's inception in the 1930s coincided with the fall, actually, of absolute sovereignty. But during the Cold War and since, the royal institution has made a most extraordinary comeback now enjoying quasi-divine status. Modern art has been an accessory to this re-enchantment and contemporary artists, if less willing, are no less implicated. Okay, this is the final session. Whatever the mutations of sovereignty, its official imagery is slow to change. While the art of nation building has required agility, to say nothing of political opportunism, Nationalist art has been tasked with obscuring its vicissitudes beneath reassuring images of continuity. Of all the nation's devices, the anthem is one of the most resilient, a genre seemingly immune to the present. And in today's ideologically mottled family of nations, the anthem is a rare mark of kinship. Its reference to the past is so essential as to be almost invisible, but nowhere is its anachronism more glaring than in Thailand. 
First-time visitors to Bangkok are taken aback to find all broadcasts interrupted and the bustle of public life stilled twice a day for a national song. These rituals inspire artworks, the most penetrating by Apichatpong Wiraseta Kun. As usual, Apichatpong leaves a lot of room for interpretation. A scene one viewer finds benign and sentimental, others will find dangerously subversive. He grew up middle class in Thailand's underdeveloped northeast, an internal margin at the very fault line of this conflict that now paralyzes the body politic. Yet despite his sympathy for marginal figures and his critique of censorship, he keeps his distance from national politics and has lived since 2007 in the northern retreat of Chiang Mai. He laments that his education gave him a poor grasp on national history, yet his films attest to a subtle, critical engagement with Thailand's complex cultural inheritance. And while they may not resolve the anxieties noted above, Apichatpong's penchant for critical framing invites renewed focus on the architecture of national belonging, its sovereign symbolic linchpin, and art's special role in maintaining both. The anthem is a five minute short that destabilizes the national imaginary precisely by isolating the paragon. As pivotal in the cinema's construction of Thai identity and belonging. It was shot on 35 millimeter and bears Apichatpong's familiar binary structure. In the first half, three middle-aged ladies sit by a canal chatting. One has brought a CD along, which she has had blessed by a monk containing a pop song she now wants to play in the cinema where she works. The song bridges a cut to the gymnasium across the canal, where in the second half, a singular circular tracking shot surveys the action. The ladies here prepare ceremonial garlands on a badminton court while younger folk exercise and play sport around them uninhibited. Titles had been the site of structural play in Apichatpong's films before, notably in Blissfully Yours in 2002, where the credits, that, that textual frame that normally demarcates the inside from the outside, instead bisect the film. In the anthem, the subtitles are not subversive, but the very title serves not only as the usual paragon naming the work, it also specifies and names the paragon and in framing quite peculiar to Thailand, where a royal anthem is played in every cinema before every film, during which the audience stands in subjection before short palace propaganda films, celebrating the monarch's beneficence and the people's devotion. As is typical of Apichatpong, no obvious political position is taken. The context is urban middle class. The ceremonial preparations do not interrupt the quotidian leisure which carries on around them. But we're tempted to read this as a portrait of a people who observe ceremony, but don't stand on ceremony. Thailand's much vaunted Maipenrai ideology. Maipenrai is a phrase meaning no worries. Yet the subject of this film, as announced in its title, is not the visual, is not the visual anthem, if you like, but the oral one, the song, and the ritual of cinematic consecration that it announces and accompanies. Hence, the sacrificial tracking of the, of the camera around this profane space, recalling a certain ceremony uh, where one circumambulates a, an ubosot, an uh, ordination hall uh, with candles and garlands like the ones being prepared here. The soundtrack, meanwhile, is the site of a cunning subversion, the arbitrary substitution of a royal national anthem with a most unregal pop song, a foreign one at that. If any doubt remained as to the artist's concern for the paragon, the last credit screen offers a final framing of its own. Now it's a singular irony of Thailand's symbolic economy that even with a royal succession crisis looming, this equivocal framing may pass for a blessing. For what may be broached in this formal substitution of the sovereign with the popular, are the very real questions facing the nation. What sort of sovereignty will be next? What sort of consecration, what rituals of fidelity and respect will be required to sustain it? What role for the modern media so long enjoined in propping up an older anachronistic sovereignty? If there's an image that can answer these questions, it won't be an image of Thainess, 
For, like many of their compatriots, Thai artists know the country will need a new kind of sovereignty to reckon with a new global reality. For some, framing offers a way to defer this reckoning, while for others, it permits glimpses of a sovereignty to come. Thank you. Yeah, the travel writer. The travel writer um, is somehow a mix of a colonialist and a refugee. Um, he's a distant artist, but he's also often uh, an involved witness, a reporter. He's trying to escape the limits of the canon trying to get away, but is also conquering new material and including it into the, um, into the canon or into what is already known. And these, these two activities uh, in relation to canon and canonization are, of course, themselves part of a genre of a tradition, something that is canonized. So before and after science, ethnology, translation, and gossip. Hubert Fichte, the writer and traveler I'm talking here about, was different from most people we normally evoke in debates on canon-related questions, not skeptical of this category, the category of the canon, nor the general practice of listing normatively essential cultural matter which everyone should know. When his publisher, the Fischer Verlag, started a series of books called Mein Lesebuch, or in English roughly, My Textbook, they asked all their well-known authors to select the crucial texts of German literature um, that they thought were essential and should be yeah, read by everyone. And Fichte replied in a typical ambivalent twofold way. First, by giving a list of his canon, and that not only in a surprising way, but also in a very aggressive, um, an aggressive typeface, an aggressive layout. Every name was one sentence. So every name was name, full stop, next line. Name, full stop, next line. Name. So the names were Homer, Sophocles, Homer, full stop, Sophocles, full stop, Petronius, full stop, Nizami, full stop, Villon, Rabelais, Quevedo, Marlowe, Defoe, Casanova, Stendhal, Flaubert, Strindberg, Lagerlöf, Proust, Euclides da Cunha, Genet, Borges. And so two ancient Greek, one Roman, one Persian, six French, one Spanish, two British, one Italian, two Swedish, one Brazilian, one Argentinian, but no German author. And he continues by arguing in a text written in Dakar, in June 1976, while on a research trip to investigate the methods and institutions of West African psychiatry, that there is no such thing as German literature for the following reasons. There is, A, no connection between uh, German writers. They are not referring to each other in the way Genet refers to Proust, who refers to Racine, who refers to Seneca, who refers to Euripides. Or uh, a Brazilian candomblé practice which refers to an African practice which refers to a practice that, according to Fichte, has even been described by Herodot. There's also no author people in the rest of the world learn German for, except, and that is also true in Senegal, where he's right now, except for these authors, Hegel, Marx, Kant, Freud. But that is, this is no literature. Theory is a fiction, he wrote in another place, but only about the people who write it. A book by Hegel is a book on Hegel. This means fiction with only one voice uh, and that is poor uh, compared to other novels, which have more characters. <laughs> uh, 
And not even for Goethe do people learn German? Fichte asked in a rhetorical mood. No, not the writer, only the institute. <laughs> But then he does indeed compile a German textbook. It has A, German Baroque literature, the most forgotten and alien part of German literary history, and one repressed by homophobic aesthetics, as Fichte argues. B, translations. Translations and some theoretical texts now by very famous authors, uh, like Goethe, Thomas Mann, and so on, but only their translations. And third, texts that one could refer to as anti-German and or ethnological. And here the outstanding examples are a text called The Negro and another one called The Indian, both by Franz Kafka. So we come back to Fichte in a while. I said he was a traveler. He traveled almost without interruption from 1966 to his death in 1986 for long stays in Om and among other places, Portugal, Brazil. Venezuela, Belize, Nicaragua, Chile, Argentina, Venezuela, Suriname, Trinidad, Panama, Grenada, Haiti, Jamaica, Florida, New York, Morocco, Algeria, Benin, Togo, Senegal, Tanzania, Bahrain, Sweden, and France. He obviously wanted to expand the canon, not only beyond Germany, Europe, the West, uh, but also um, he learned plenty of languages and um, he wanted to um, uh, obviously understand, if, if possible, all languages. And of course the only, the only framework for that, the paragon as one could say, in a, uh, using a category that has been used this afternoon, uh, was the genre of the adventure story. To travel means to alienate. It is a, producer to, it's a procedure to either make yourself alien for the world around you or to make the world alien for yourself. In both cases, we talk about procedures which seem to artificially and deliberately recreate the conditions upon which the concept of Western individualism and thus author-based art is founded. Conditions of singling out, of distinction on the basis of subjectivation. No wonder the legion of novelists being travelers. But already in the narrative which accompanies and legitimizes the tradition of apprenticeship by traveling journeymen, this experiment with individuation has become institutionalized by the institutions of knowledge and skills acquisition. You, you had to do these journeys as a journeyman in order to be a proper craftsman. Learning people make long trips to acquire knowledge, mostly in form of other forms of production and other skills, but they're also expected to acquire maturity and character by the double game of becoming a stranger for others and making your immediate surrounding strange for you by traveling and thus changing it. By implementing this trick, the less is finally strange around you, and the continuously more refined strangeness within your subjectivity has been uh, sublimated into maturity and skillfulness. Within the German literary tradition, the German canon, this is mirrored by two classical and one can easily say canonical journey destinations in the south, Italy and Spain. Both reappear as competing holiday destinations for German mass tourism in the 1950s till today. For Renaissance artists and later for the self-educating young bourgeois, Italy was the place to study beauty, described and framed by different theories and ideologies of beauty. Whereas Dürer and his contemporaries went to Italy because they had to, in order to learn from the most advanced production of beauty of their time. Goethe, when he went, only had to register already existing beauty and could spend the rest of his attention with complaints about bad administration and the dubious psychology Italians are suffering from in compensation for the abundance of natural and cultural beauty. But the celebration of light 
and meaning of an enlightened and thus meaningful beauty, which was always the reason for the Italian journey every educated German had to do, produced a counter movement which started in the early days of Romanticism and became strong in the late 19th century, the journey to Spain. Spain had a dark beauty as opposed to the enlightened beauty of Italy. Whatever darkness meant in each specific Romanticist persuasion was indeed not decided, but it was a critique of rationality, of the, also the rationality in the all too quick success of the travel strategies when traveling to Italy, of Goethe's consumerist pleasures. Making yourself strange should not as easily turn to such distant and uninvolved aesthetic enjoyment accompanied with German arrogance about a deficient service industry. The types of knowledge that you acquire by alienation and its eventual overcoming would have to be more cathartic. Otherwise, the whole genre of travel writing would fall into decadence. The protagonists of the Spanish journey were advocating depth and they liked the sentimiento tragico de la vida. They liked fanaticism and radicality, be it an anti-rational death drive in tauromachia or just political radicalism. It was shared actually by French, by French travelers. This Franco-German line connects the romantic German translators of the Spanish classics with art historians like Müller Gräfe and surrealists and people like surrealists like Georges Bataille. And later Spain, of course, was also the territory where the German uh, um, um, fascism and uh, yeah, uh, had its testing ground, but also armies of voluntary communists and anarchists fighting uh, Nazi fighter planes and each other in the Civil War. Hubert Fichte started, uh, if you wish, third German and anti-German travel tradition. He was uh, a child of the uh, he was born in 35, but, but uh, as a writer, kind of a product of the 50s, he was um, one of the persons who were, um, uh, who, whose protege he was, was, the, was Walter Höllerer, a translator and, uh, and a person who collected, um, who kind of produced um, liter literary, uh, literature events. And, uh, and he had invited him in to to Berlin, to the uh, colloquium, Literature Colloquium Wannsee, and there he met other uh, contemporaries. And then in this, in this period, Höllerer was kind of the person who imported Beatnik literature to Germany and who had uh, helped to, uh, to publish Ginsberg, Kerouac, and others. And so those were travel writers, and uh, those were romantic um, romantic traveling writers, and Fichte, when he read them, thought, um, I could do that better. Uh, and so um, he started traveling himself. He went to Portugal, that is a little bit further west from the other two destinations I mentioned. And there he wrote a book, but the first book was the, the first book that came out of travel was a book on, on his hometown Hamburg. But behind Portugal, as Danny Kubik would have said, behind Portugal there was infinity. Or as Fichte had once called it, the total other other. <laughs> the misleading category ethnopoetry, which was applied to Fichte several times, has categorized him often along the line of other methodologically ambitious travelers of a surrealist provenience like next to Bataille, for example, Michel Leris. But although such a fan as we've seen of French literature, Fichte rejected this quote, Bataille, Leris, Bastide, they were all colonialists, unquote. He declared in a crucial reflexive moment of his 900 plus pages novel, Explosion, the novel of ethnology. In this novel, the writer Jackie and his photographer partner Irma pass through three transformations. In the first part, they arrive 1969 as tourists in Brazil. And one could maybe say that the first the first concept of traveling and learning is connected to craft. The second concept is 
uh, is the mechanization of these effects of um, of the, the, the traveling journeyman who learns a craft, the mechanization of the effect of learning through traveling, which is then in educated uh, bourgeois writers. And the third version is, of course, the industrialization of this procedure, which would be mass tourism. So they arrived there as mass tourists. They, they came with a, uh, with a mass tourism organization, uh, Neckermann, and uh, arrived at the Copacabana uh, in, in, a, in a tourist hotel in 69. To overcome the dreadful state of being tourists and to finance their stay in Brazil, they became journalists. Um, they, they tried to sell their articles and photographies to several different uh, German magazines and journals. And, uh, uh, and the novel has a lot of um, debate about uh, if it's if it's worse to write for Spiegel or worse for Die Zeit, and uh, uh, and that in the Die Zeit at least treats or the Stern is even worse, but the Stern even treats uh, uh, photographers decently and, and and gives them credit, whereas the Spiegel doesn't even do that, and so on. But um, um, but they learn quickly about the failures and the lack of freedom of that form of production, and deciding at the end of part one to become something else some kind of scientists, some kind of, they, it needs to get more objective, more, more real what they're doing. In the spirit of the era, think of Althusser, science seems to be the only reliable and decent form of the alienation and de-alienation process at the basis of knowledge production and acquisition beyond accumulation and industrialization. In the second part, they decide now in Salvador, in the state of Bahia in 1971, to become ethnologists. The transformation is now felt differently. It's that it does not only apply for the change from a profession vis-a-vis -vis the Brazilian reality to another profession, like from tourist to journalist, but also to the deeper identitarian kernel that had made the first two possible, namely writer and photographer. That's what they are beyond being journalists and writers or literature or poets. Quote, should I really refrain from be, being a German author who ponders over train stations in Hölderlin and become a full-fledged ethnologist? Unquote. Would the writer as a basis disappear once the critical journalist becomes an ethnologist? And would that be possible? But the second part of the novel also proves it is impossible to become an ethnologist. Instead, it is necessary to write a novel about ethnologists themselves and all the other ethnologists who hang out in the extended Brazilian field between Rio de Janeiro, Salvador da Bahia, Belém, Manaus, Recife, and São Luís de Maranhão. Especially about the strange relation between Fichte and his alter, Fichte's alter ego character Jackie and the well-known French Pope of Bahian ethnology, the photographer and ethnologist Pierre Verger. The character, um, the character Verger, in an exposed moment of this novel, makes a statement on his involvement of, uh, with the Brazilian, uh, the Afro-Brazilian Candomblé, of which he is not only a photo documentarist and ethnologist, but also an important leading priest and religious authority. Quote, I do not make photographs anymore these days. The more you know, the less you want to document the more you know, the less you ask." Unquote. Hmm. In the third part, they finally become, after these doubts of, uh, of, of um, the methods of Verger that I will come, to back, will come back to later. In the first part, they finally become something like veritable ethnologists, but 10 years later. In the meantime, they have been in every, nearly every other part of the world, and then they have to return to Brazil where they started their ethnological exploration. And they come now to other parts of Brazil, especially in São Luís de Maranhão uh, and other parts of the Brazilian Northwest. They do a kind of real, um, serious uh, ethnological uh, exploration. 
But this has a lot of consequence for the generalizations I made in the first place about travels and the German canon of types of travel. They have an effect on three underlying research questions that the novel exposes. First is how transparent is translation. Second, the dialectics of truth and secrecy. And third, will sex be the answer in, in, in brackets or the ideal medium of translation? First, how transparent is translation? Ethnology is for Fichte the science of translation, not only for Fichte, also for the character Jackie in the novel, uh, not the structuralist grammar of culture. In a polemic essay, not within the book, but in, not in the novel, but elsewhere, he accuses Claude Levi Strauss and then in the novel, the entire French school of Afro Brazilian ethnology of a cultural colonialism based on the ignorance of the languages of the people they are talking about. The, the alleged ignorance vis a vis these languages leads to the structuralist overestimation of relations and social rules, which Fichte tries to correct with what one could call a semanticist approach. Quote Has he ever asked one of the people living in the tropique? whether they are really triste? <laughs> no, he hasn't, because he couldn't. He did not speak their language." Unquote. <laughs> this alleged French arrogance installs into the very logic of traveling and travel writing, which I exposed in the beginning of this talk, a kind of artificial petrification. The initial alienness of the traveler who resists the dynamism of slowly acquiring more and more familiarity. Um, instead, this, this is not possible because he's not learning the language. Instead, uh, it implements a static mechanism of formal description, which can continue forever. It doesn't, doesn't, con doesn't change because there's no learning involved. This petrification, called structuralism, is leading, according to Fichte, to a permanent distance between ethnologist and ethnological object, and by that, to the, finally, to the false category of objectivity of science, which has no place in ethnology, according to Fichte. Instead, it should be replaced by the self-reflexivity of a novel on ethnologists, in which ethnologists become characters. This was, was, would expose, as in the novel is exemplified by the character Pope Pieri, based on Pierre Verger, the primordi primordial libidinal nature of ethnology, the sexual or quasi quasi sexual desire at the heart of social relations, which everyone knows about uh, and include every social being, but not the ethnologists. They do not acknowledge this, at least not about themselves. So Fichte finds out that Pierre Verger uh, preferred black-skinned lover, uh, just like Fichte, but he did not believe this would be a part of the truth conditions of his ethnological findings. Sexual desire is just another meaning, just a signified, not a signifier. And thus, so Fichte's one can say not totally unbiased view of Saussure and structuralism, not of any importance for French ethnology. Second, the dialectics of truth and secrecy. Not only the traveling writer makes herself or himself alien to the social world around her or around him when traveling, and the social world alien to him or her by going to unknown places and cultures, the production of alienness through opacity is a common feature of truth procedures, as argued, for example, by Edouard Glissant. One of its tools is secrecy, as has been studied in detail, for example, by Georg Simmel. The Afro-Brazilian religious practice of candomblé, which is important for this novel that I'm talking about, is, among other things, shaped by a virtuous and complex culture of different stages of secrecy. So different from a world that is just strange and alien because the traveler had not seen it before and arrives there for the first time, Candomblé and other Afro-Brazilian and indigenous cultural strategies, which are already based on experiences with colonial repression and slavery, are actively making themselves strange to the stranger and to the local outsiders as well. 
To a large degree, they do that because of those experiences with repression, but also they do it because the controlled revelation of truth is only possible by speech acts that are based on the previous keeping of a secret. Only after you had installed, kept, and cultivated secrets and secrecy, a controlled release of truths in the form of revelation or other religious formats is possible. Fichte was impressed, fascinated, and also critical of this operation, which he did not describe in such abstract categories. Rather, he articulated time and time again how the practices of Candomblé and similar other, others based on diasporic Yoruba traditions at the same time seem to be an expression of cultural difference, a legitimate celebration of something that is to be respected by agreeing to not fully understand, and at the same time a procedure that in its truth claims wanted to be understand, uh, to be understood, needed to be understood, and was on the level of uh, universal ideas of understanding and sameness. The rituals and their protagonists remind him, for example, of the Catholic nuns in the orphanage he grew up in, or of the Salon of Madame Verderin in Proust's Recherche. Both social practices which have this in common with Candomblé, the dialectics of secrecy and revelation, of closet and gossip, which for him was at the center of his question. How he could be at the same time so deeply attracted by rituals and dreaming of a world, and at the same time dreaming of a world completely free of rituals. The absence of rituals equals freedom is the title of one of the last interviews he ever gave. But the colonial asymmetry in structuralist alienist to meaning does not go away in a semanticist world of translation. Not only because language is not transparent, a structuralist truism which is not reserved to structuralism, but also because the two sides of translation are not existing in an agilitarian context which the produce, procedure of translation suggests. Can the association with Madame Verderin in an act of candomblé be reverted? Third, is sex the answer? The secret of the ethnologists, according to Fichte, is less their asymmetrical status of an unmarked observer. It is their desire, their libido. There is a societal institution that relates to that secret in the same way that religious rituals relate to the truth of religion. This institution is called gossip. Fichte is gossiping a lot and thus creates a tension between the traditionally fictional space of literature and the religious space of revelation, of truth. Literature cannot reveal because the trace of subjectivity informs its language. Religion cannot invent because the suspicion that it's nothing but an invention is too strong. But gossip can mediate between truth and subjectivity be it scientifically objective or ritualistically revealed. And if you believe Fichte is temporarily taking utopian position, it can also escape or supervene the colonial imbalance by its relation to sexuality. And that is, at least in the first two thirds of the book, the good universality of sex. It is not only in this novel that above all male homosexuality is described as a code of tenderness that crosses all kinds of barriers. This utopian character is based on the relative privilege of men in many societies to enjoy a certain freedom of sexual experimentation, Fichte declares. He does not invest a lot of time in the critique of this privilege, but he sometimes concedes the same freedom to lesbian women, who play indeed a large part in the religious establishment of Candomblé. The relative freedom of men to enjoy a promiscuous homosexuality across all lines of ethnicity, tradition, and even libidinally driven by the desire to meet and love others is, of course, surrounded by many dangers to turn into its opposite, exoticism, for example. But Fichte insists on the relative validity of the utopian character of male homosexuality because of the special role it has in religious secrecy and ethnology both being just masks for an almost already liberated character of exchange beyond exchange value. 
In part two of the novel, the director of the Goethe Institute in Salvador de Bahia explains to Jackie he can only get to know anything about Candomblé if he lets himself be initiated. This, this, is, this is the only way. And Fichte replies, no, I don't need to do that. But it's the only way. What else would you do? Well, I could sleep with them. And then the Fichte comments, that was too much, even for the progressive director of the Goethe Institute. <laughs> in the final part of the novel, in the third part, Jackie no longer really believes in this, let's call it hippiesque gay liberation idea, what he called the Verschwulung der Welt. Actually, interestingly, Fassbinder used the same uh, the same term, and uh, it's I could I tried to find out who coined it first, and uh, um, it I couldn't find it out. I also don't know. I don't think that the two of them have taken it from one for the other. I think they both came up with it at the same at the same time without referring to the other. Um, he has already in earlier stages of the novel described how organized sexual masturism has turned exactly this potential into a commodity. He is constantly watching the development of the Spartacus Guide, which is in the beginning some kind of a samistad, uh, underground fanzine-like publication, and is already kind of a glossy, uh, glossy book in the early 70s, into a tool of the tourism industry. In the last part, Jackie and Irma practice a relative classical ethnological approach to several Afro-Brazilian practices, and no longer the, the, the no longer is the is the is the role of sexuality uh, that important. It's it's only important in, uh, in on the level of content and the question he asked people, but no longer uh, it's, it's no longer the underlying um, uh, important uh, force. Jackie has a plan for a huge literary project of 25 volumes the contemporary and post-European version of Proust's Recherche. In the first sketch, which is mentioned in the early part of the novel, it is called The History of Tourism. Tourism being the origin and the end of the global sexual utopia. Later, Fichte really starts this project, and the novel I'm talking about becomes volume four of 18 books that he manages to complete before his death in 1986. But the title is now different. The title is now The History of Sensitivity, Die Geschichte der Empfindlichkeit. And in order to save Empfindlichkeit, the idea of a radical revelation by sexuality had to be dropped. The science of ethnology and the religious ritual will have to be reconsidered as a means of product, uh, protection. But gossip as the main instance of self-reflexivity is still more valid than ever. In a manifesto about the crisis of the humanities, the sciences of the mind, as they are called in German, Fichte argues that only an ethnologist who is able to write a sentence like, I'm learning Wolof because I'm gay, is worthy of his discipline. But that also means that the ultimate goal of gossip is yourself. And if yourself becomes uh, the, the object of gossip, then you are back in good old autobiographical um, subject-oriented literature, confessional, autobiographical. And not only that, you're also, in a way, complicit with the social rules um, that uh, provide the veil for the gossip that you, that you use for your revelation. And that is, of course, a problem. And this problem they are kind of talking about in, the, in another in another novel of that cycle of novels, uh, which is a very melancholical, short novel, kind of novel on methodology, and it's called Forschungsbericht, a research report, in which they kind of um, uh, run into dead ends with their ethnological project in Belize, and they are betrayed by cab drivers, and other problems arise, and uh, just about to drop the project of continuous traveling. And then in the moment of um, catharsis, they decide to get rid of the narrative, get rid of truth and truth procedures, get rid of secrecy in order to uh, nobilitize or legitimize revelations, get rid of 
the the ways around the world, but just keep two just two elements of of the travel literature project, and that is the the leaving, the running away, the 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 leaving home, and the other is be everywhere at the same time, be omnipresent, be ubiquitous, and uh, that is the that is the kind of uh, desperate utopian. Uh, attempt to save uh, and at the same time of course to to leave that genre that project of travel literature thank you